Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to explore the case of United Airlines Flight 629. Now I'm not sure if this case is familiar to any of you, but from the time I first learned about it several years ago, I was shocked that no one else I knew had ever heard of it. I mean, not only do I know a lot of other true crime lovers, but there are a bunch of pilots and aviators in my family who, unlike me, were around at the time. But none of them knew this story. First, I need to insert a sensitive material disclaimer here. Warning, the following video contains material that may be harmful or disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Anyway, let me set the scene. It's November 1st, 1955. A family named Hop in Longmont, Colorado were just finishing supper when they heard a massive crash behind some buildings on their sugar beet farm. According to Conrad Hop, who was 18 at the time, the noise was so loud it shook all the windows in the house. Then they heard the roar of the engines, and that's how they knew it was a plane. They ran outside in the dark, and Conrad and his brother drove Conrad's car toward the fireball through rows and rows of alfalfa, all the while dodging flaming, falling debris. They finally stopped the car and discovered a large, as yet unidentified object consumed by a raging fire. Now this is where Conrad, in his interview with investigators, had trouble getting out the words to describe what they saw that night. And it's easy to understand why, once you hear it. They were staring into the flames, trying to process the scene, when they realized the burning object was an airplane seat. And before they could force themselves to look away, they saw there was a body, seat belted in and on fire. They drove back home, ran back inside, and called the police. Wow, talk about a heavy image. Clearly, these witnesses, as well as all the investigators for that matter, have got to be emotionally scarred and damaged by what they will never be able to unsee. Okay, moving on. Now, by this time, the cops had been receiving other calls from witnesses who watched a commercial airliner crash to the earth in the town of Longmont, which is about 40 miles from the Denver airport. Now, even though it was pitch dark, investigators reported to the scene with searchlights and handheld flashlights to frantically search for survivors of the crash. But it was soon clear that no one could have survived this blast, which had strewn debris and, well, body parts across the vast expanse of farmland, which was an area measuring six miles. Everyone on board was dead. Among the victims were 39 passengers, some on business, some traveling for pleasure. According to FBI reports, they ranged in age from 13 months to 81 years, and there were five crew members. Now, I should probably explain that airplane travel was much different in the mid-1950s than it is today, in quite a few ways, actually. For one, air travel had historically been considered luxury and was reserved for people of means. You know, regular Americans generally traveled by car or train. They didn't splurge on pricey airplane tickets. And those who did fly were dressed in their church clothes. It's not like today when we dress for comfort and wear Daisy Dukes and flip-flops when we travel. Back then, getting on an airplane was a special occasion and a really big deal. But around the time of the crash of Flight 629, which was also known as the Mainliner Denver, United had been running a marketing campaign encouraging all travelers to fly with them. Their commercials boasted, compare the fare, you'll go by air. Sadly though, quite a number of the deceased passengers on the doomed flight were experiencing jet travel for the very first and last time. Flight 629 had originated from LaGuardia Airport in New York and was scheduled to make a number of stops, including Stapleton Airport in Denver and Portland, Oregon. But shortly after departing Stapleton, as we now know, the plane exploded and crashed for reasons unknown, at least at that time. It was up to local investigators and the FBI to put all the pieces together. Let me stop here. Now, when I say put all the pieces together, I don't mean literally, but I could. I mean, it was somebody's job to identify all the bodies and determine what had caused the explosion in the first place. 
The natural assumption was that it was just a tragic, horrific accident, likely caused by some sort of mechanical failure or maybe a leak or some sort of situation involving the fuel. But in pretty short order, they would uncover another first. Flight 629 was the first documented case of jetliner sabotage in the United States. The victims did not die in a tragic accident. They were all murdered. Is this crazy or what? How do they even figure out where to start? I don't mean to be gruesome or insensitive, but you've got bodies, 44 blown up bodies that needed to be ID'd and if possible, returned to their families. So 44 victims might not seem like a lot to those of us used to modern air travel on really enormous jumbo jets, but each of them was somebody's loved one. Eventually, Life Magazine ran photos of all the victims, which included a five-year-old boy and his mom meeting the little boy's dad on military leave. There was a crew member who had been a last-minute replacement, and a woman named Daisy King was headed to Anchorage on an extended holiday to spend Thanksgiving with her daughter and grandchildren. Think about it. Each of these people had been here one minute and were suddenly gone the next. Now, one other thing that I didn't personally know about traveling by air back then was the life insurance. Did you? Apparently, there were little kiosks in the actual airport where you could purchase a life insurance policy in case you didn't make it back. I guess we still sort of have that, you know, in the form of travel insurance. But when I buy that, it's generally for my own financial protection in the event of a hurricane or the shitstorm that was 2020. I'm not sure what I would do if I was confronted with my own mortality by a faceless machine in an airport terminal. Now, getting back to the investigation, I'm sure that even seasoned investigators with decades of experience had no idea where to even start with this explosion. With the exception of what was believed to be an accidental explosion on another United flight back in 1933, or maybe the Hindenburg, there had never been anything like it. For the record, no one has ever conclusively figured out what happened to that other United plane carrying seven people. But the running theory for the past 88 years was that one of the passengers, who had reportedly been acting very strangely, was carrying highly explosive nitroglycerin in his luggage. To this day, they're still not sure. But somebody did figure out the mainliner case and the investigators comprised a big lot, including FBI field agents from Washington, D.C. and Denver, officials from the Civil Aeronautics Board, engineers from United Airlines and the Douglas Aircraft Corporation, among others. And they started by gathering all the pieces of mangled metal and wreckage, some very large, others quite small, to essentially recreate the aircraft. Working in a grid formation, they collected every scrap and struggled to reassemble the parts in a nearby airplane hangar. Again, this was all new territory. Nothing like this had ever really been attempted before. At that point, they set about uncovering whether something inside the plane was responsible for the crash. Was it the aviation gasoline, which was more volatile than other types of fuel? An explosion would tear and rip the metal outward. And by examining these pieces and fragments, investigators determined in less than one week that the fuel tank was not the culprit. The source of the explosion was traced to the number four cargo hold. They needed to determine, was this an accident? Had a passenger, like the one on board the earlier United flight years before, packed something in their luggage that they shouldn't have? Like the nitro that caused the earlier crash? Every fragment contained in the cargo hold was scrutinized. Upon examining a scrap of metal, which smelled strongly of sulfur, an FBI forensic chemist determined that it had to be dynamite that destroyed Flight 629. With the aid of some copper wiring that was not part of the airplane itself, a bomb was deliberately ignited by persons and reasons unknown. Now this was impossible for anyone to comprehend. This story had rendered the entire country spellbound, and people wanted answers. How could anyone randomly kill dozens of passengers on purpose? Who could be so diabolical, so evil? 
The first group questioned were union workers. There had been recent strikes and picketing, and the investigators were aware of the long history of union violence in the state of Colorado. Maybe it was an inside job? The pilot of the doomed flight had just crossed the picket line at Stapleton Airport, so the union angle carried a lot of weight. Let's just cut to the chase. It wasn't the union. It wasn't someone on the inside trying to get even. Shockingly, it was someone on the outside who had his own grudge to bear. FBI field agents traveled throughout the country to interview relatives of the passengers and crew on the plane. Logical questions related to marital discord, someone with an enemy, somebody with a financial benefit to be gained were posed to every family member and eventually it led to the real motive. It ultimately was determined to be the life insurance. Someone on the outside had a material interest in the death of another someone on flight 629. But who? After researching all of the life insurance policies purchased from what were essentially vending machines, no one stood out as an obvious target. None of the policies were to pay out an excessive amount. But that was the motive. They just had to prove it. Next, they spoke to all the baggage handlers. Did anything seem suspicious or off? A random set of lost keys by a baggage handler in Chicago resulted in the number four cargo hold being emptied of any luggage that had not originated in Denver. That left three suitcases. Now they were getting somewhere. And of, of those three pieces of checked luggage, only one bag was large enough and heavy enough to contain the homemade bomb. That bag belonged to one Daisy E. King, the prim lady in her Sunday best who was headed to visit her grandkids in Alaska. Miss Daisy, for real? Now what in the world would possess a 50-year-old restaurant owner, actually I believe she was 54, and grandmother to pack dynamite in her Samsonite? The short answer, nothing. She didn't know it was there. But clearly someone did. When investigators began sifting through the personal effects of the passengers, they found a few unusual things belonging to Daisy King. They found a number of personal letters, traveler's checks, keys to a safe deposit box. I know, these items are pretty standard. But they also found newspaper clippings. Clippings, mind you, not the whole newspaper like one might read on a long flight. Why is that unusual, you ask? Well, the articles were about Daisy's son, Jack Gilbert Graham. Jack had been charged with forgery by the Denver County District Attorney and was placed on the local most wanted list by that office four years earlier. Pretty shady, right? And it's also highly unusual that newspaper clippings had somehow survived the blast. But that's what happened, and those articles put Jack Graham at the top of another list. He became the prime suspect in the sabotage of Flight 629. Now the FBI performed their due diligence and conducted background checks on everybody, but they paid very close attention to Daisy's son, Jack. He was born in January 1932 to Daisy E. Walker and William H. Graham, Daisy's first husband. Graham Sr. had passed away when Jack was three years old, but his natural parents had been separated since Jack was a toddler, and he was raised by his grandmother until he was nine. Upon her death, Daisy sent Jack to live at the Clayton College for Boys, dubbed a progressive orphanage. Jack visited his mother and her new husband, a well-to-do rancher, during holidays, but he was always returned to the orphanage. His resentment for his mother grew and festered, even after he came to live with her and the rancher when he was 13. Jack reportedly felt abandoned by his mother, and his behavior ranged from unruly to criminal. From his teens until the planting of the bomb when he was 23, Jack Gilbert Graham's life was one botched scheme after another. Daisy bailed him out of one jam after the next, always covering his losses. Eventually, though, she came to fear him. Even after she gave him a job managing her restaurant, the Crown A, and after he had married and started his own family. Jack tried all sorts of things to get back at his mother for her cold, loveless treatment of him, 
including rigging an explosion at the restaurant six months prior to the plane crash. Nothing was proven, but Jack was the prime suspect in that case as well. And he would later confess to trying to blow up the place in yet another case of insurance fraud. Now I mentioned that Jack had started his own family, his wife, the former Gloria Elson, and two children under the age of two. In fact, it was his faithful wife, Gloria, who unknowingly gave investigators the one piece of information they needed to seal the case against Jack. When questioned, Gloria recalled nothing out of the ordinary the morning Jack drove his mother to the airport, but then she recalled a package. It was a gift Jack planned to give his mom for her trip. He claimed the box contained tools for crafting, and he had even mentioned to a neighbor that he planned to sneak the surprise, Christmas present actually, into Daisy's luggage. What we now know is that Jack actually loaded up the suitcase with 25 sticks of dynamite, a six volt battery, a timer, and several blasting caps set to explode 20 minutes after takeoff. The explosion actually occurred about 10 minutes sooner. He did this with no hesitation or remorse, all for the express purpose of cashing in on a life insurance policy he paid $1.54 at the airport. Ironically, many of these policies cost as little as a quarter. One detail I found to be particularly crazy was that when Daisy's bag was weighed, it was over the limit by 37 pounds. Jack stood at the counter with her, anxiously counting off the minutes in his head until the timed bomb would explode. She had the option to remove items from the suitcase or pay an additional fee of $27. Jack talked his frugal mom into paying the overage fee, thus eliminating the opening of the bag inside the terminal. When he was finally interrogated by investigators, Jack was pretty cool at first, but with just a little prodding, his story fell apart like a slow roasted brisket, and he confessed to everything. In fact, he delighted in watching his mother board the doomed plane and stated that he was, quote, happier than I ever felt in my life, end quote. He had no feelings for the others he killed, explaining to a Time Magazine reporter, I can't help it. Everybody pays their way and takes their chances. That's just the way it goes. Jack's mouth continued to get him into trouble, and he turned out to be his own worst enemy. After recanting his confession, attempting suicide, and feigning insanity, Jack flapped his gums to anyone who would listen. He told neighbors his sole regret was that Daisy never got to see his Christmas surprise. He was deemed sane and fit for his trial, which we began April 16, 1956. The court proceedings lasted 15 days, and there was a veritable ton of evidence against him. And here comes yet another first. The state of Colorado versus Jack Gilbert Graham was the first trial to allow television cameras. Court activities were not broadcast live, and anyone in the courtroom could opt out of being on camera. The only person to choose that option was the defendant himself. On May 5th, 1956, the jury took just 69 minutes to render their verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree for the premeditated murder of a single victim, Daisy E. King. Graham was sentenced to death with a scheduled execution date of late August the exact date and time to be determined by the warden. Against his wishes, two of his attorneys filed an appeal, and the execution was stayed on August 8th of that year. In October, the Colorado Supreme Court affirmed the lower court's decision, and the week ending January 12th, 1957, was set as the new execution date. Graham did not request a last meal, but they brought him steak, fried potatoes, tossed salad, fruit cocktail, and ice cream. Only the ice cream was eaten. Graham was executed in the gas chamber on January 11, 1957. His wife, Gloria, had remained faithful to him to the end. However, following the execution, she did change the family name back to Elson. Because there was no federal statute on the books in 1955, making the bombing of an aircraft a federal crime Graham was only charged with a single count of premeditated murder. However, in 1957, Congress passed an act making airline and bus bombings a federal crime. 
In a final twist, Graham's ashes were spread at the cemetery where his mother is interred. So there you go. Another twisted case of truth being stranger than fiction. I hope you enjoyed this suspenseful true crime story, grim as it is, and I hope you'll join me next time for another. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day. Scary Clary out.